Hello and welcome to Spy Brewery. We're joined by David Craggs and also author Jeremy Duns. There's this new book that's just come out by a chap called Ian Fleming. I'd never heard of him before. I believe it's his first book. David, you picked it up as well. What did you think about this, this Casino Royale? Well, uh, we'll come to that in a minute, but I first heard last year when some wag told me that uh, Peter's younger brother, Ian, was heading out to Jamaica in early 52 to get married. And uh, rumor was he was gonna write a book at the time as well. And um, we've all been on tender hooks until the release. And now here we are, April 53, uh, he's done it. He persuaded Jonathan Cape to publish. Uh, we've been waited with bated breath. And we've, we've got it, you know, so it's, it's good. And we needed something to lift us out of the doldrums because a lot's been happening. Uh, we lost uh, our monarch. We have a new monarch now. Uh, we still have Winston, but we still have bomb sites that are unclear. We have bomb sites in High Holborn. We have bomb sites in Piccadilly. We still have rationing. These are, these are glum days. So us Blades members needed something to lift us out of our doldrums, and it looks like uh, young Ian Fleming's done it. Well, it's, it's all right thing. for you Blades members. You know, those of us in the working classes in Wales, we're still stealing sugar ration books. <laughs> well, we'll let you have one of the first 4,728 copies of Casino Royale so that you can uh, educate the populace down there, Shane. But you say that as if this book is going to kickstart some huge series or worldwide phenomenon or something. It's a, it's, a, it's a debut author's book. I mean, you really think people are going to remember this next year, David? Is it that good? Well, you've read it, Shane, so we'll discuss how good it is. And Jeremy's read it as well, so he'll discuss how it is. Yeah, Jeremy, what were your thoughts on the book? First time well, writer and all that. Well, I think uh, it's a fantastically uh, presented book. It's a very, uh, very nice cover, which I understand that uh, Ian Fleming himself was uh, instrumental in designing. Um, it's unusual they come out Cape because they don't publish thrillers at all. Uh, usually Hodder, Hodder and Stoughton are the, are the big publishers now. They publish The Saint and, and The Toff and all those kind of things. And... Cape, I don't think I've ever published a thriller before. And my contacts in publishing have told me that in fact, um, it's only because his brother Peter is a very famous travel writer with Cape that they accepted Absolutely. it. And in fact, Jonathan Cape, the head of the company, did not want to publish this. Um, and so I was a bit worried going in. Uh, the rumor is that it's a very dark book. And I think it does, it does hold to that rumor. It's much darker um it, it, than the most thrillers that have come out in the last few years i would say and it's it's a fascinating and i think a brilliant book and dare i make a prediction i think this might well go on to be a series and even it could be potentially you know a worldwide phenomenon possibly films i agree and i think that uh, jeremy's made some really uh interesting and good points there um He's right, Cape did have to be persuaded by all accounts. And it was really Peter, Peter Fleming, his brother, putting the word in for him that, that got him published. But Jeremy and you, Shane, you've been reading, you know, The Saint, you've been reading Sapper about Bulldog Drummond, you've, you've been brought up as I was on John Buchan and all of this good stuff. How does it, you know, how do you think it compares this new book? Uh, you know, I have I have my views, but how, how do you think it stands up? Do you think it changes the game somewhat? Uh, Shane, do you want to take that first? or Sure. I, I mean, for me, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. I thought this was just going to be another action thriller, and it didn't turn out to be that at all. Um, I... I like the glamour of it. I mean, I've never set foot into a casino before. So to read about how a casino works and certainly like the, the darker side of casino, you know, with the, they, they talked about the cashiers with the coshes and the security aspect and then the glamour of it. So that, that was interesting to me, but it was not the all action hero I was expecting. The saint is a gentleman, whereas some of Mr. Bond's comments on women, for instance, threw me a little bit um 
And also the fact that this is a very cold, calculating spy, secret agent call you what you will. There was very little humor here. He was like a machine. So I found it hard to kind of feel any sympathy for him until that latter third of the book. So it was very, very different for me as a read. Jeremy? Yeah, I think, I mean, I had lots of thoughts reading it. Um, I mean, one of them was that, it, it, very similar to what you say, it's, it's a very much darker and it's a more hardened agent. The plot is fairly familiar from the likes of, of Buchan and Sapper and, and even previously uh, E. Phillips Oppenheim and a bit more recently Dennis Wheatley. You, you have books that are set in, in casinos and the femme fatale and, and all of that stuff. But I think the writing really lifted it for me. It, yeah. it was, it, it's influenced, I think, partly by, by French, by the existentialist school. Yeah. Um, and you have a French agent in it, uh, René Mattis. Uh, yeah. And there's sort of quite deep philosophical conversations between Bond and him, and they have a great relationship. Um, but then it's mainly influenced, I think, um, you know, partly by the tradition that David was just talking about, Bordeaux Grumman and so on. That's sort of the plot. But the actual writing, I think, is is partly influenced by pulp fiction from the States, um, hard-boiled fiction. Bond is a very hard-boiled kind of character. He's repeatedly referred to as being cold, ruthless, brutal. In fact, I think all three of the main characters, Vesper, Bond, and Schieffler, are all referred to as cold at certain points during the book. But then, struck, struck me reading it again, it really reminded me, the pro style really reminded me of Ernest Hemingway. It's this very stripped-down, mm, uh, sparse, uh, simple, things are described as they're tough and good, they're, they're, they're solid and comfortable. You know, you, you have this, he's using very concrete terms and very simple terms to describe things. And I thought that was, that is a game changer, I think. That I don't think we have seen in the British thriller before. That's interesting, because I've been reading uh, some of the Americans, I've been reading Mickey Spillane, I've been reading Raymond Chandler, etc. And what really struck me uh, about uh, the book that I think is constructed a fairly heady cocktail where there's sort of due respect played to the clubland heroes that we're all used to. But there is definitely a hard boiled edge to this uh, where I think there's been, uh, as Jeremy was saying, quite a, a solid uh, American influence and you see it straight from the get-go when it opens up in in the casino uh, the famous opening phrase etc and you see it at the very end as well where dare I say it it's got more of a ring of, uh, of Spillane about it with the end of either jury uh, and uh, it's it's really really uh, different I think it's really new it's different and it's better. And uh, I think we will definitely see a series. One of the things that struck me about the book as well when I picked it up is that clearly um, he, he's done a lot of work with the presentation of the book. Um, Jeremy alluded to the fact that he, he helped to design the cover himself. He's taken a strong interest in that. Uh, evidently, he, uh, he persuaded... Uh, the, the head of uh, creative uh, of his newspaper company to uh, to design uh, the cover with him and he's taken great care over the elements and I think that that together with other things that will doubtlessly come on to has sort of taken it up market if you like um, I don't know I'm sure it'll go down well in Wales uh, Shane uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the mining community down there will, will, will grab this straight away. But, uh, and for the rest of it as well, I think it's, it's very interesting. It's have, you, have, have you guys, sorry, sorry, Shane, I was just going to say, have you guys seen the, um, seen the Guardian's review of it? Uh, I, I, I haven't actually, no. I just if I don't, if you don't mind, Shane, if I just read quickly, because it's, quite, Go for it's it. quite interesting. So Mr. Ian Fleming's Casino Royale, Cape, 218 pages it's a very short book it's worth saying yeah. 10 shillings 6d is a first through who is a secret a dedicated gambler a communist spy for villain with a sinister organization on his heels and a breathtaking plot 
But this schoolboy stuff is galvanised into life by the hard brilliance of the telling. The episode in which Bond gambles against Le Chiffre in the casino is as unbearably exciting as a later scene of torture is horrifying. The Secret Service background, too, is expertly drawn. Only the girl is unconvincing in more senses than one. I thought that was quite an interesting uh, review. That's uh, 17th of April uh, in, the Gar in the Manchester Guardian. That is an interesting review. That is an interesting review. I mean, I mean, what did we think of the plot? Did we think that the plot was, uh, was realistic? I mean, he has this chap, uh, Le Chiffre, or, or the number, as he refers to him, uh, a rogue uh, Russian agent that's a sort of compulsive gambler, and he's supposed to be financing a, the, the trade union, creating this sort of fifth column and he goes and uh, buys a lot of brothels instead. I mean, uh, is this, uh, do we think that element's realistic? I, to be honest, I found it very intriguing. So what I will say is, is reading the book and not having much, you know, I wasn't really rooting for Bond at the start of it. Yes, we're British, we, we can't stand the communists and what the Soviets are up to, we get all of that. Um, but the storyline was intriguing. So I wanted to see where it was going to go. And you're right, Jeremy, it's a short book. It's a fast read. And yes. talking about the writing style, you know, I read it in an afternoon. So yes. even though it took me a while to warm up to the main character, I still wanted to, Fleming has this skill where, you know, I want to turn each page. I want to find out where the story is going. Because I was intrigued by, oh, here's a card game. This guy is betting everything on, on winning at, at the game and Bond needs to beat him. Very, very intriguing story. Um, one that makes you want to keep reading. Well, I, I warmed to it straight away and I actually found that the plot uh, to be entirely credible. I mean, you can imagine uh, a rogue uh, Russian agent uh, uh, financing, sent to finance a trade union and then sort of, because he's a compulsive gambler, um, you know, losing or, 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 or as the story has it, he invests the money in a, in a chain of brothels. And then that goes pear shaped because they changed the law in France and they've, they banned brothels, which I think would probably have been regarded at that or is regarded at this point in history as being um, un-French, you know, but they've done it. They've, uh, they've, closed, uh, they've closed their brothels and they've left this guy high and dry. And as a consequence, he's trying to rip, rip, win the money back at this hard stakes uh, game. Incidentally, I've been looking on the map and I, I can't find this uh, Royal Lazur. Uh, does anybody know where it is? I think he's invented it, hasn't he? It's a sort of combination of, of Deauville and a few little towns around there. And if I understand, I mean, Ian Fleming, he comes from a very wealthy background. Obviously, his brother Peter's the famous travel writer, but the Fleming banking family is wealthy. And you can tell, in a way, I think, that this is a wealthy man who's written this book because this is someone who knows France. He knows wine. He knows food. It's extremely... Um, ascribes the different social classes. This is also a, a gambler's book. This, is, this has been written by a gambler. Yes. So for me, the, the plot, the plot, he makes it incredibly plausible yes. by the sort of details that he, he, he uses. But in fact, if you look at it in the cold light of day, it's really quite absurd. The idea that, you know, somehow this secret agent is going to be, you know, only a gambler would think that you, there is the finest gambler in the service. This is a game almost entirely of luck. He has to get an eight or a nine. You know, the British Secret Service is gambling a huge amount of money to humiliate this guy. And then when Bond wins, the chief kidnaps Bond and get, wants to get the money out in that way. So if he was going to do this, why on earth didn't he just kidnap the Maharaja who's loaded, who is at the casino? Why did he need to gamble at all? If he can kidnap someone, he can just kidnap someone with lots of money and get the money out in that way. So I don't think that made much sense. Well, uh, I don't think Vesper made much sense, but sorry, well, go on. Ex accepting, Jeremy, he does make the point at the outset that you would need 10 no-squeal killers just oh, yes. from the cashier okay so probably you need more to kidnap the maharaja okay but i didn't i also did not understand at all vespa's job what's her job actually meant to be how is she meant to be assisting bond 
that's uh, yeah. that's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. But it the the thing is, you don't. The guy writes so well, you mm. don't ask yourself these questions. No. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and he punk. He he punk. He has an obsession with the high life. This guy because he punctuates his writing with all of these brand references. Yeah. I mean. You know, when Wheatley writes his stuff, uh, although Wheatley did, Dennis does drop a few brands in from time to time himself. But, you know, when Buchan writes his stuff, you, you jump into the car. You jo don't jump into a, a Bentley blower with an Amherst Villiers supercharger. You know, uh, he, he's going into, he, he gives a lot of detail here, which sort of grounds the thing in a certain way. Uh, it grounds it at a, at a very high level in society, but it grounds it in reality. Um, I mean, how many brands does he mention in this book? I mean, you've got his cigarettes, for example, the uh, the Moreland cigarettes. Have you ever smoked those, David? Um, I haven't, but I, I, if I were to, I don't think I'd consume seventy a day. <laughs> I mean, when he when he goes upstairs. To, to his room, I was seriously worried. If you were on 70 gaspers a day, would you make it up there, you know? Uh, but he clearly uh, has a different stamina and, and uh, much more developed appetites than me. And that shows not just in his smoking, by the way, but he's, he's drinking as well. Uh, I mean, this, uh, this cocktail that he's, uh, that he's made is it's quite a quite a heady brew i mean you're talking two parts uh, gin one part vodka uh one part um uh kina lillette yeah uh, i mean how many of those could we could we have don't forget the lemon peel ah uh, well that Yes, that probably dilutes it sufficiently. But. I'm, also thinking, I'm also thinking at one, at one point he has caviar and toast, he has champagne. I mean, he, the, the poor person back at uh, headquarters who's doing the expenses, I mean, this must be the most expensive mission British intelligence has ever run. I mean, the guy is just literally just sitting there drinking champagne and eating caviar uh, and smoking 70 cigarettes. I mean, he's not expensing that. But, I mean, he's staying in a very flashy hotel. Um, he's He's literally... His mission is to gamble with a huge fortune. I mean, it's an extraordinary idea for a British intelligence mission. But I think it comes back to what you were saying, David, that, you know, this is a grim time. We're recovering from the war. And what I think is quite refreshing, which we, we probably should have mentioned earlier, is that this is not a book about the war. It's not a book set in the war. There are references to the war. There are several people who don't have arms or legs because of the war. Um, James Bond is a veteran of the Second World War, and it clearly influences it. But the enemy, as you say, he's a communist. This is a Cold War spy thriller. And looking at the market around at the moment, there's a lot of detective stories. There yeah. aren't many, and there are lots of things set in the war, but there aren't many Cold War set spy novels now so that's quite unusual so he's already moved the bucken and the sapper and all that stuff into the cold war era and i think that's quite interesting it is actually it is and I, that's a real it, that's a real breakthrough uh, actually because that fleming of course was Fle fleming was in it was in the war he was the director he was the aide to the director of naval intelligence so one might have expected that he would come out with a wartime thriller but no, he's gone straight into this uh, into this thing with Redland, as he calls them, and and this fantastically sinister organisation, Smash, who he comes yes. up with, which I've never heard of before, but sounds absolutely authentic and and chilling. And I really think, I mean, I, I know it's just come out, but I think we can possibly risk a few spoilers here. And I think that the ending of the book, where he essentially vows that he will go after Smash. Um, is a brilliant device to set up a series. And I, yes. I really hope that we hear a lot more of this uh, sinister organization who, after all, have actually saved Bond's life in this book, which is quite an unusual. Yeah. Well, Jeremy, I think, you, I think you had the big spoiler at the start of our conversation by saying you think there'd be more of these books to come. <laughs> yeah. So during that torture scene, you know, he's- oh, I, I'm not so sure there'll be more. I'm not so sure there'll be more. This is know? a one-off, you think? Yeah, it could be. I mean, 
I, I wanted to, I want before before we hit that I wanted to chime in about the the food and, and the drink because there was one one line in it which made me smile where he says to Vespa you must forgive me I take a ridiculous pleasure in what I eat and drink yeah. it comes partly from being a bachelor but mostly from a habit of taking a lot of trouble over details it's very persnickety and old maidish really but when I'm working I generally have to eat my meals alone and it makes them more interesting when one takes trouble True. True. And I think, and I think a fantastic justification for, I mean, as I said, Fleming is from a wealthy family. He's a journalist at the Sunday times. Um, he, he was involved in espionage during the war, but he's not now. And this is a high luxury mission and bond bond has essentially got the same tastes as the author. So how do you explain that? And this is quite a cunning way, I think of getting around, you know, of explaining why this guy, he hasn't explained how he can afford a Bentley, but he has explained why this guy is so fussy about, he doesn't like pajamas, but he likes these things that he got in Hong Kong. And, you know, he has a Ronson lighter and all of these kind of things, but it, it feels true. It feels plausible i think i think the thing that i found fascinating about this is that on the face of it this is totally implausible everything about this is implausible the plot is implausible the villain is implausible um the secret agent is you know far too high living but it feels real it feels like you are in france in this little resort you feel the sense you know he starts and he, he it's glamorous but he starts by bond is feeling sick you know, it's mm. three in the morning and yes. it's not glamorous. So he already subverts it from the beginning by showing you the sort of dark side. And as this book progresses, almost like a play, it's like a play in three acts, it feels, it becomes progressively darker. It's a, it's a love story and it's a tragic love story. And you have this really brutal, horrendous um, torture scene that, you know, feels very... Uh, very very dark and then you have an even darker ending where it turns out that the damsel in distress has faked the whole thing and she has her own tragic love story behind her and she's actually lured bond and that she's a spy which reminded me you know of this scandal i don't you don't know if you remember a, a year ago there were these two um foreign office guys who absconded i think their names were burgess and mclean and there yes. was sort of rumors that they might be double agents. And I wonder if Ian Fleming somehow has some sort of inside track, perhaps with his old contacts and intelligence, because it yeah. feels like Vesper, you know, she works in the Soviet section of British intelligence. Yes. Um, and she's got all these documents. And uh, I mean, that's a very, very, um, un uh, it's a very surprising ending for this kind of thriller, I think, yeah. to, have, to have that yes. happen. Yes, it was. And I, I, th I thought personally, uh, for me, uh, I, where I, I, uh, I vary a little bit from, from Jeremy, is I think the idea of Le Chiffre getting himself in this mess is plausible. Okay. I think the idea of British intelligence embarking on this mission is much less plausible. You know? mm -hmm. uh, but... The, I enjoyed the whole thing. And when I got to the last sort of third, um, the love story plays quite a big part in this, actually. Um, it's, uh, it, it must be a good 20% of the book, I would have thought, uh, the latter part of the book. And yeah. I found it incredible that sort of having, um, having his... Um, he, 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 the, enduring the torture that he has, uh, being able to spring back so quickly uh, in the... Uh... But he was worried about springing back in certain parts of his anatomy. Exactly. <laughs> this was... Uh, I mean, I thought, yeah, I thought sort of, you know, I admired the fact that you could sort of endure that and sort of spring back so quickly. Yes. Uh, but the fact that he's contemplating marriage... Yeah after three weeks yeah after just having a drink with her in the casino um i wonder if this reflects ian's own mental state while he was in jamaica writing this mm. i think that's a very interesting point because also there's this conversation he has with vesper um when they are staying in this kind of little place towards the end yes where she says that everyone is an island 
and that even if you've known someone for 50 years, you can't really ever know them. You, can, you can't touch, the islands can't touch. You can just approach and Bond gives us, I think the only really kind of wry, amusing line he has uh, in it where he says, well, let's, let's get together and form a peninsula, which yes. sounds to me, that sounds like something the saint might say. Um, one can almost imagine a slight raising of the eyebrow when he says that. Um, but I thought that that concept, that, that idea um, for, for someone who's just got married, um, is quite is quite an intriguing thing but then also she says don't worry because i feel that my island is rather closer to yours today and i found that very poignant actually i found that very touching that idea her whole idea i find found her a fascinating character she didn't initially seem to me to be british at all she seemed to be completely french when you first introduced to her we don't yes. we don't know her first name to begin with and i think fleming has been very clever in this book where he withholds quite a lot of information. So you're waiting for the shoe to drop. So you meet him in the casino, but we haven't met, yet met Schiffler. And then we go back and we find out about this. But it's yeah. not until about halfway through the book until we actually meet the villain. And similarly with Vesper, he, he waits quite a while, even when he's met her. He just sort of talks to Mattis. And you're wondering, he's already set up that this woman's coming and he's annoyed because he's a bit of a sexist and he's, you know, so he, he very cleverly plants these things. And then towards the end of the book, he has this thing where it's niggling in the back of his mind that something's wrong about how she did stuff. And then this phone call and there's something wrong. And so the whole way through you're reading like, what are these, it's masterfully done, I think, as a thriller. But yeah. What are these things that are going to happen, you know? Because yeah. he also sets that up earlier in the book where he writes, and I'll just read this quickly, even more, Bond shunned the mise-en-scene for each of these acts in the play. The meeting at a party, the restaurant, the taxi, his flat, her flat, then the weekend by the sea, then the flats again, then the furtive alibis, and the final angry farewell on some doorstep in the rain. <laughs> yeah. See, like, this is a guy who doesn't you really like dating, and then you he's get to that. He's a cad. He's literally, a cad. he's a cad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I also it's very I can recognise the scenario. <laughs> <laughs> but but I think he... it's also, sorry, Shay, I thought, thought it was also very interesting that he earlier, um, when he learns that his, Mattis tells him that he's going to be teamed up with a woman, he says, oh, women, they always get, you know, always gets in a bit like the, the passage you just read. It's always a scene and they always get, end up in tears and they get so emotional and sentimental and the whole thing's a mess and they don't keep their eye on the job. And by the end of the book, as David said, you know, he's known her for two minutes and he's contemplating marriage. I mean, yes. talk about, so he's the one who actually gets all completely emotional. I mean, she falls in love yes. with everything. But I think also David, I think, might be right that this might not be a series. I took it that the ending where he says now he's going to go after Smirsh was setting up this uh, series idea. But in fact, normally when you have series, which as you know, they're very common that you have these thriller series. You have the, the Spillanes, you know, you have your main protagonist and you keep going, you know, the saint has had how many things. So I thought it was something like that. However, in those series, you can't actually dramatically change the circumstances of the protagonist. So, you know, if you're going to have a series, you can't resign and travel the world because then you're no longer a secret agent. And James Bond considers that in this debut novel. You can't marry because then he's no longer, you know, what's he going to do? We're not going to follow the adventures of James Bond married to Vesper. So the fact that he's already considering that in this book, I think is it possibly, possibly means that we're not going to be, be a series here. This could just be a, a brilliant one-off that we never see again. And perhaps we will never hear of James Bond ever again outside this book. And I think you're right. There are so many, for a book that's only 218 pages, there's a lot of moving parts because there's that at the, at, towards the end of the book where he says to Mattis, history is moving pretty quickly these days and the heroes and villains keep on changing parts. So, you know, you start out with him being this, you know, British secret agent working for the government against the communists. Then you've got the whole card game. You've got the torture scene. You've got the chase. You've got the, the love story. But then you've got Bond thinking, you know, who is good and who is evil. So there's a lot that's going on in the book. It's kind of all over the place, really. But it works. I thought, yes, I thought it. What, what did we think of the other characters in, in, in the book? Uh, I mean, what, what did we think of the supporting cast? 
I mean, he introduced I loved, I loved quite light, a... I loved Lighter. I loved yeah. Felix Lighter. I thought that was, a, that was a great, great touch. And when he gives him the money and says, you know, martial aid. And he, yes. he was fun and, and he was believable as a Texan, I thought. Yeah. Um, so I hope, you know, if it were to be a series, you know, perhaps that would be quite nice if we were to see a bit more of him. Also, I thought he had a very fascinating, that whole conversation with, with Mattis. When I would talking. give an arm and a leg to have lighter back. <laughs> I see what you did there, David. Um, I, I thought the, the conversation he has with Mattis was brilliantly handled, brilliant dialogue. And Mattis kind of gently ribs Bond and says, you know, with Englishmen, you know, it's so interesting. You, you know, it's such a nest and you, you pick and you pick and there's nothing really there in the end, but it's quite fascinating, you know, getting along the way. So, you know, do carry on talking all your nonsense about how you, you think that there's no difference between us and the communists. And yeah. there's a sort of playfulness to their, to their um, relationship that feels totally uh, natural and yeah. um, as if it's been around for years, which it's meant to have been, and completely plausible. I mean, it's hard in some ways to, to, to uh, realise that this is a debut novel. It's an incredibly assured piece of writing. Um, that said, Fleming has been a journalist for yes. several years, and you can tell, because yes. when you have stuff, what, what, what's journalistic, I think, is that Fleming has realised that the best, that the way that thrillers work best is with knowledge and information. And this is a man who's incredibly knowledgeable. He's incredibly knowledgeable about France, Fleming, about France, about gambling, about food, about women, about sex, about love. It's psychologically very astute. And you sense this is a lived life. He's an older writer. This is, this is not someone who's writing his first novel when he's 20. And yeah. it comes across that all of this stuff feels lived in. It feels, yes. as Shane says, there are lots of different parts but it feels like a whole life, has, this is often the case with first novels, it, it feels yes. like it's been gestating for years and his whole yes. life up until now, he knows spying, you know, as well. All of it's gone into this and it's come out, I think in a, in a, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant novel, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And the cast of characters, it, 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 it it doesn't, as Jeremy was saying, it doesn't read at all like a first novel. And the cast of characters as they appear seem very well seated. You know, you have the mention of his boss in London, M. You have uh, the introduction of, uh, of Miss Moneypenny. Um, you have uh, Rennie uh, Mattis from the Dozium Bureau. Uh, and so on and so forth, and they they seem like he's he's talking about characters that have been around for a long time. Well, you and know, the, Miss Moneypenny would have been desirable, but for eyes which were cool and direct and quizzical, David. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> but that's quite interesting, isn't it? Because because he says he, she would have been desirable, except for eyes that were cool, direct, and quizzical. But Vesper is described almost in exactly those terms. She's yeah. cool. She's detached. She's ironical. Um, she looks, you know, so it, it's a it's a bit strange that whole thing. And also Vesper, I think, in a way, is a sort of it's she's an enigma, you know. And uh, that's what attracts Bond, that she doesn't immediately, she, she's playing hard to get in a way. You know. What's interesting though about the female aspect of this is if you actually compare the way Fleming has, uh, has handled the femme fatale vis-a-vis -vis the way that uh, Buchan uh, writes about women, the, the way that Sapper, uh, wrote about uh, women, the way that, you know, Spillane writes about women, etc. He, 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 he handles it much better yeah. than this is many much, of his contemporaries. It's much more three-dimensional. This yeah. feels like a real yeah. woman. Yeah, I, uh, I felt that. Um, and uh, yeah, good, good for him. Now, the, he, the, the character himself and the way he's described uh, this reference to uh, Hoagie Carmichael, yeah? Um, I could envisage the character very clearly. I thought, I thought Fleming did a good job at that, you know? Um, it, it, he wasn't a cipher. He was, uh, I felt him as sort of flesh and blood. If 
as Shane says, a little cold at the outset. But um, it just seemed to me very mechanical. And there was that scene, David, where he goes back to his hotel room and it says he examined a faint trace of talcum powder on the inner rim of the porcelain handle of the clothes cupboard. It appeared immaculate. He went into the bathroom, lifted the cover of the lavatory cistern and verified the level of the water against a small scratch on the copper as you, do, as you do when you check I mean, into a hotel. Doing all this, inspecting these minute burglar alarms did not make him feel foolish or self-conscious. He was a secret agent and still alive thanks to his exact attention to the detail of his profession. Routine precautions were to him no more unreasonable than they would be to a deep sea diver or a test pilot or to any man earning danger money. So he, he's a pro, he's a machine. Well, the, a things that you've just, the things that you've just mentioned there, Shane, are really the things that set it apart. Yes. Because the, the, obviously Fleming knows a thing or two about espionage, as Jeremy said. He knows something about this. I mean, these are, I mean, okay, there have been, in previous books, you know, there have been some elements of what might one describe as sort of trade craft or the spy game, but this is very meticulous stuff. Um, yeah. Even down to the way that he hides uh, the check from uh, Le Chiffre yeah. in, the, in the door number, you know? Yeah. Very clear. Yes, the letter. Uh, uh, it, it's it's all you know, very meticulous stuff. And again, I think that's part of a big part of what sort of grounds it, makes it move. He doesn't fire a gun, does he? Does he fire in this one? No, no. He doesn't I, fire his gun. His gun is mentioned under the pillow, but it's not. Well, no, he has the other thing that's different. Well, he has he has three guns actually. But there's no big firefight that you come to expect. Yeah. Uh, no, but he has his police positive, which is under the pillow at the beginning. He has his Beretta 25, and then he has his Colt, Colt in his Bentley, the, yeah. uh, the long-barreled Colt. And all of that seems quite well thought through and meticulous as well. Yeah. I mean, I think the meticulous thing is important. I think, first of all, that you're lulled a little bit into a sense of false security where you think this is just a glamorous holiday almost. And then yes. suddenly you realize when you're in the casino scene, there's a point where it feels like it's just, I'm betting against another rich guy for a while. That's what it feels like bond against Shifa. And then suddenly you realize that there are people who can kill, you know, so yes. they're killers in their midst. So then you realize this stuff with all the secret agent talcum powder and all this stuff is important. And then all of this stuff, the, the, the espionage details, the, the, the mechanics, as you said, Shane, all of those mechanics of, of espionage, of gambling, of the game of Baccarat, even of, um, you know, food and wine and all of this stuff. It feels like you're in very safe hands and it feels like you're being taken into a world you don't know by an insider. And that's yeah. what works, I think, because that makes, I mean, some of this is very implausible, I think. For example, Vesper at the end, she, in her letter, in her suicide note, says that she was very careful. To, she gave as little, little as she could to the Russians. However, surely Vespa could just have told Smirsch at mm. the very beginning that Shifra was a traitor and where he was and he'd embezzled money because she knew this because she was going on the mission. In which case, none of this would have been necessary. <laughs> One would not have had to, they would have just taken him out. I mean, they had a whole thing where they didn't want to, but I mean, so, but these things you skip over because he's so knowledgeable yes. and he fe it feels so authentic and plausible yes. that you don't care and you want to go along. And I think the thing about Bond starting off is this, you know, you're, you don't warm to him, but he goes through a nightmare in this. He goes through, a, you know, in 218 pages, he goes through a complete parabola, a life-changing thing, where he's this world-weary, cold, rather mechanical agent who, by the end, has, you know, been horrifically tortured, fallen in love, and then discovered that his lover has betrayed him and his country. So that, that contrast works very well, I think, because you, you don't really like him at the beginning. Um, but then he gets his comeuppance and by that happening, by the fact that it's not an easy win, it's not, as he says, a romantic adventure, as Shifra says to him, it's not a comic strip thing, but it becomes deeper 
you know, if it, if we'd had a sense of that earlier on, it wouldn't have worked. I think it, it works that he's a bit arrogant because then we, we kind of, there's a journey that he goes on that we want him to go on. And I think that's very, very effective. Yes, without doubt. What were your thoughts on the torture scene? I thought it was quite shivering uh, and, uh, and very, uh, very brutal. Um, and, and again, in a certain way, I think it was more indicative of the American hardboard foil style, you know? Um, I mean, I would never compare the two as writers because Fleming is a much, much better writer. But Spillane is very uh, violent in, in, in these sort of torture scenes and so on and so forth. Um, much more so than Raymond Chandler, for example, you know, who has a more elegant style. And I do think that coming back to what we were talking about pretty much at the outset, that the American influence is writ large. And I see, I think you see the hard boiled uh, influence uh, of the American style in that torture scene, actually. Mm. Um, I can't think of uh, any other European, I mean, okay, Dennis Wheatley, um, there's some pretty, um, but he doesn't go into so much detail. It's not. I think he doesn't, he doesn't go into so much detail, but I think there's also a style. This is an extremely stylish, elegant book. Yes. And I think yes. that he combines that there's, there's, I think what's groundbreaking about this novel is that he's taking a lot of the elements that were already in the British thriller and he's taking this kind of stylish stuff, but he's, he's combining it with the sinister. And this is most effective in the torture scene. I think one of the most effective details in the torture scene is that Shifra is drinking coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's so small, such a small thing. Yes. But it's not the great big bad villain making a huge, great speechifying thing. You know, he's just sipping his coffee. And the fact, and what, what in a lot of these things, Wheatley in, in Charteris and a lot of these things, they're very elaborate tortures, very elaborate villains. And what, what's so chilling about this torture scene is that Shifra says, you don't actually need any of that stuff. You don't need to have electrodes and scalpels and all this kind of scary stuff. All I need is this simple carpet beater for you to be naked, you know, and basically exposed under this chair. And that's it, because a man will not, it's as simple as that. I'm just going to hit you in your private parts with this thing until you talk. That's so simple. And it, it kind of cut, it subverts everything. It cuts, undercuts the whole genre. And, and he, it, Shifra, when he does speak, he says, no one's going to come and rescue you. It's not like the books. That's not what's yes. going to happen. I mean, ironically, of course, it is. You know, a man yes. in a black mask, you know, comes yes. at the last minute. Um, and Bond is not really responsible for that. But I think, I mean, my understanding is that Jonathan Cape did not want to publish this book, partly because Jonathan Cape himself did not like it and was not interested in thrillers. But also that the, um, the, the chief uh, person who was in charge, a chap called Michael Howard, thought that this torture scene was so sadistic, especially the, um, the passage where it talks about the sort of sexual parabola that one gets to when one's being tortured, that it was seen as just beyond the pale and that this was just too much. And, but my sense is that this is drawn from real life, that Fleming knows spies. I don't think he's made that detail up. I Correct. think that comes from something real. And yeah. I think that actually this will go down, whether or not uh, anything ever happens, if we, we, if we never hear from Ian Fleming again, if he never writes another book, um, and if he just goes back to his desk job at the Sunday Times, I think this torture scene is a classic because it is really pushing the envelope. It is far, far more brutal than anything that has been in the genre uh, so far. It almost pushes the boundaries of, to be honest, what can be published today um it, and that's why they were squeamish about it and you know so i think i think that is going to be the defining obviously the ending which is it ends with a, a sentence with the word bitch in it um but that that ending and this torture scene yeah. um are what will define i think this book yeah i think that's a fairly safe yeah. and i yeah. i think uh i mean I have no inside knowledge, but I, I did hear 
from uh, from uh, a friend of Fleming's that evidently he is back out in Jamaica on his three months sabbatical and he is writing something. Oh, so really? uh, okay. let's hope it is a sequel. You know, so I think we'd all we'd all I, want to see more. I'm I'm intrigued. I like the writing style. As I say, it took me a while to warm up to the main character. I think what I particularly enjoyed was. Bond is not this all action hero and there's one part where he talks about his job and it says Bond frowned it's not difficult to get a double o number if you're prepared to kill people he said that's all the meaning it has it's nothing to be particularly proud of yeah so yes, he makes they, they he makes reference to his previous kills doesn't yes, he yes i like that yeah. yes I mean, the, uh, I, wonder, I wondered about that because he has this thing where, you know, so he has a license to kill. I'm not sure that phrase appears, but that, that appears to, he's allowed to kill. Um, but to get to be allowed to kill, to be a, a double O, you have to have killed someone twice. So how was he allowed to do that then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a little... <laughs> kill two people and then you're allowed to kill people. That doesn't yeah. really, really make much sense. So perhaps if he is writing a new one, he can he can sort that out. But I liked, I again, he's got this. What I think is, it's a bit like the branding. He's got a brilliant um, eye for detail. So the mm. fact that it's he's a double O, you know, and that his his thing is 007 and that she's thirty thirty and all of these kind of things, I think, really add a flavour. To, to this and I think picking up on what Shane said I, I think what's fascinating about James Bond as a character is he doesn't go out of his way to make us like this guy to tell us that this guy's a great big hero which you definitely get for example with the saint I mean it's almost for me it's almost a bit much that Charteris essentially wants us to be in love with the saint um, and if you're not well you know get lost he doesn't yes. make that kind of effort but also Wheatley with Gregory Salas we, we're so clearly meant to identify whereas here Bond is his own person. He has his own tastes. He's pernickety. He's not a simple secret agent. He's quite thoughtful. He's psychologically astute. Um, it's a love story. There's a, an erotic element to it. There's all sorts of stuff. There's an inner life to this character that I found extremely surprising. He's not simply the flat machine who you're first introduced to. That whole discussion he has with Mattis about, you know, that he's basically saying, uh, what's the point of any of this? You know, who, what's the difference between us and them? It's an incredibly surprising way to react to having been tortured in that, in that way. Yes. Um, so I think there are lots and lots, there's lots of hidden depths here, actually. Yeah. It's remarkable yeah. in 218 pages. Like I say, yeah. there's so, so much to, to the book. And I, I have never been to France and just reading, you're right, with Fleming's journalistic background, how he describes the casino. And David, I know you were in Northern France. I know you were both at Dunkirk and D-Day, but I imagine you didn't <laughs> go to Royal Les o. Um You were in other parts, no doubt, and it wasn't quite a holiday for you. <laughs> I was hiding out. <laughs> There are several references Bond makes, aren't there, to, to his wartime work. Yeah. He's, M has sent him on several missions since the war. So this is a kind of a veteran, I think. Um, he's hardened. He's a hardened agent. I think that, that word has been used for him. And he starts that way, you know, with the, the, the chapter where he checks all, all the kind of stuff. Then you sort of forget it a bit. Then you have the whole love story. But then at the end, he reverts back to the professional. And he mm -hmm. immediately dismisses. He says at some other point, he might come back and think about Vesper. But right now, all he can think of is that, you know, she's betrayed him, betrayed the country. And that, you know, this image of her walking down, um, excuse me, this image of him, this image of her walking down a corridor with documents and that, that they would, she would just give the enemy the, the, the secrets on a tray. I think this is one of the things that's also brilliant. There are little flashes of, nice writing, uh, phrases, uh, images, um, perceptions of other people that you wouldn't normally get in this kind of thriller that sort of lift it, I think, into another class. I think yes. it's very, very interesting. Yes, I think it's, uh, it has the feeling of being more literate. Yeah. You know, but I didn't uh, think that when I was reading it. It was just a good story, you know? I was flicking through, I wasn't looking at the style, and I guess that is the secret to being a good author that you don't really notice it until you sit back and think about it. Well, one thing, I mean, we're all, you know, I, we, we can tell through this conversation, we're all very enthusiastic about this new, uh, this new writer and this new work. But when you look back and you sort of think of the thrillers that you've read, given the fact that we all have influences coming from everywhere, 
who do you think was his biggest influence in 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 this uh, in in this work? What would you think was was his biggest influence, Jeremy? If you had one, I mean, I think a massive influence, not a literary influence, is just Fleming's own life. It's very clear, I think, that James yeah. Bond is modelled very much on him. Yeah, even his cover as a as a, you know is Jamaica, yes. um, and we know that that Fleming has his place in Jamaica. Yes. Um, also, his background in the war, in intelligence, the fact that <clears throat> uh, Bond is a gambler. But my understanding is that Fleming is a huge thriller fan, and yes. you can you can see, I, I think what's great when you write it when you writers normally are readers. I mean, if you're a thriller writer, if you're going to write a thriller, um, you start off by reading lots of thrillers, um, and then after a while, you think. I don't really like that kind of thing. And you develop a taste and then you know, like, that's the sort of thing. And then after a while, after that, you think if I were ever to write a thriller, I would yes. do it my way and I would do it this way and I would do that. Yeah. And eventually those ideas develop gradually. And I think yes. that's what's happened here. And yes. he's taken a lot of things, but I think one of the things that he's done is he said, what he doesn't like is the, the he wants to lift the writing. And I think he doesn't want to have Pat happy endings yes. and obvious twists and stuff. So he's got a yes. series of extremely dark things that, that totally overturn what you would normally expect in yes. the genre. So he yes. even has a bit where someone talks about, yeah, I think Shifra says to him, you know, you're not going to get the girl and all of that kind of stuff. So yes. he's really quite, I mean, the Shifra is almost commenting on thrillers quite blatantly. You know, it's not yes. a romantic adventure. He has another thing about it. It's, a, it's not a comic strip that is mentioned somewhere. So he's, he's going out of his way to try to get away from them. However, however, um, I think it's very clear that he's influenced partly by The Saint, uh, Leslie Charteris, um, huge, hugely successful series with a number of films, a series of films, of course. Mm -hmm. um, partly by things like um, Sax Roma, um, Fu Manchu, Bulldog Drummond, Sapper. Um, partly, I think, by Eric Ambler. I think mm -hmm. the Chiffre seems it, that feels like an Ambler character. Like yes. The, you remember yes. Dimitrios. Yes. He's kind of in the shadows of the underworld. That feels yes. more like from Ambler, Graham Greene, that kind of thing. And then I think uh, there is a lot of uh, um, Dennis Wheatley's Gregory Salas series here. So there, mm -hmm. there is uh, a novel called Contraband which is yeah. the first sort of proper Gregory Sallust. And that starts out with Gregory Sallust, who is uh, Britain's greatest secret agent uh, yeah. in Deauville uh, at midnight uh, in the casino uh, gambling. And then a beautiful woman walks, walks in the room. And it, it, the, the, the plot is not similar, mm. but at the, end, at the end of that book, Sallust uh, wants to uh, run away, re resign from British, you know, working for the British uh, intelligence uh, services and travel the world with uh, mm -hmm. the, the beautiful woman who bears a passing resemblance to Vesper. So I think the sort of atmosphere of it and the vibe, uh, he, he definitely must have read that, I think. There's another mm -hmm. weekly novel called Come Into My Parlour, uh, yes. which was published in 1946, in which yes. he has Admiral Canaris talk about um, how a British, uh, the sort of M figure, if you like, of Gregory Sallust uh, in the 20s had cleaned him out um, at, at Baccarat at the casino in Deauville um, right. and then sent him the money back because of the parlous state of post-war German finances. That seems to me quite a big coincidence. So it, it, some, somewhere along the line, I'm pretty sure that Fleming has read those what books. about What about a French influence, uh, Jeremy? Oh, yes. it, you yeah. have so you got... Here. Jean Bruce uh, with his uh, Hubert Bonacieux de la Basse rolls yeah. off the tongue nicely. Yeah. Um, it, it's, uh, it's well, I know you're a fan. I know you're a fan of those. Uh, the OSS one one seven. Well, I I read a couple in 1947. You know, so it's preceded this by a good six years, and there are yeah. similarities. I mean, I think, uh, there are. I think there are definitely. I mean, he yeah. he, if I remember, he is a sort of half he's an american with french ancestry yes just working for the oss and his living in with his family in louisiana yeah that's right and his code name is 117 yes <laughs> so i mean you are getting quite close there he likes he likes fast cars yeah and he likes beautiful women yeah and uh he's a good looking boy yeah perhaps his I, I name guess. is a little more difficult to pronounce yeah, I mean, I think I think what's clear from Casino Royale is that Ian Fleming 
really knows France. This isn't yes. someone who's just been a yeah. tourist. Um, yeah. Apparently, he speaks fluent French. I can well believe it from reading this from reading this yeah. book. And so he's clearly gone to Dover and the area around there. He's clearly gambled until five in the morning yes. and done all these things. Yes. Um, and so if he were there, I mean, these are bestsellers in France. Absolutely. So it stands to reason that he would he would be aware, you know, that he would try to do that. To, to, I mean, of course, there are many characters who are high living British, you know, or secret agents. Yes. But it is interesting that the Americans are involved in this operation, the French intelligence yes. is involved in this operation and British intelligence. Yes. I mean, why? I mean, really, is it plausible that they're all going to meet in this one casino in this tiny town to take down this one guy who's a brothel owner who happens to be, you know, it's a lot of secret agencies involved in this operation. And I yeah. wonder if that's not a bit influenced by Jean Bruce, because yeah. he, you know, he's working for the CIA. So or the OSS as it, as it, as it yes. was in 1947. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a broad range of influences. I think he, what but I think it's important to say this is this has its own thing. I mean, this, oh, has, this has its own voice, uh, yeah. very, very st yeah. strong sense of um, its own personality, its own tastes and its own style, I think. But yes, I think there are in the background quite a lot of different influences. I also wondered the Le Chief torture scene. Was that Noel Coward? Because didn't you keep calling him my boy? <laughs> 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 is, that, is, is he riffing off his neighbor? Yeah, Noel <laughs> Coward, seriously. <laughs> I it, well, that could be uh, that could be very much the case. Yes, that could be. Very I mean, I don't know about you. I found I found one thing that I didn't think was very effective about the Shifra is I couldn't imagine him as easily as the other characters. Yeah. Um, there's very detailed physical descriptions of all of the characters, but the description of him seemed a bit of a mess. He starts talking about his earlobes and things like this, and I was never quite sure: is he a fat man or is he not? Oh, he's or, fat. He, he's definitely he's, he's, fat. He, he, yeah, but it, I don't he's know. Not very he, tall he, either. I, I couldn't picture his face. He's got this sort of reddish hair, reddish brown hair, and yeah. it, it didn't. He didn't sort of quite fit the way that he yeah. acted. It didn't quite mm -hmm. fit with the description that he had. That might be because I'm more used to, he wasn't an archetypal villain, I think. Sneaky um, though, I, because it said that he carried three ever sharp razor blades in hat band, heel of left shoe and cigarette case. So yeah. naughty Nothing piece of Nothing unusual about that. Well, not where you live. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go out in the Surrey Hills without that. <laughs> we'll go to blades. Yeah, correct. Yes. No, I thought he. I thought he was quite a. Uh, I thought he was quite a gruesome character, and his bodyguards yeah. were uh, were ever present. Uh, oh, yeah. The one part of the book which, um, you know, in, in the believer, I, I take completely on board um, what Jeremy says about if you look at it in the cold light of day about the sort of whole thing. Uh, but that's true of of, uh, of of most of what we read. Yeah. But I think that um, the part that d didn't work for me actually was the part in the in, in the casino where the bodyguard yeah. was threatening to assassinate uh, Bond with, with a this stick. gun disguised as a walking stick, because you, you on the like one that. hand he was telling us that it would take six or ten non-squeal killers to rob the cashier on the way in but it would be perfectly okay for somebody to come up with a uh, a, uh, a shotgun disguised as a walking stick and blow your back off in the middle of a uh, a backer again that's you true I, I hadn't thought about that i hadn't thought about that yeah. Although I would and say the way that he defeats him by throwing his chair back yeah it's a bit weak you know it's uh it's uh it that to me actually was the weakest moment in the book yeah i think I think that the bit with the chair, the resolution of it's not very good. I agree yeah. with the plausibility. That doesn't make much sense. However, I thought that whole scene and the way that he has the countdown where he just whispers, cease, and then yes. you know, set. And yes. I thought that was incredibly effective. So he built yes. the tent very well. But I agree that the, 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 the premise behind the, the idea of the assassination, I also thought the thing with the Bulgarians, I mean, it was quite kind of cute and quite neat, but it was rather contrived, I think, you know, the whole, do we really need that whole kind of backstory with that? And Bourne keeps Oh, escaping. I like that. I like that. But I mean, he's, he's escaping death sort of by chance quite a lot. I mean, okay, he throws his chair back, that's him doing stuff. But yes. it's chance that he's behind a tree, a trunk of a tree. He's rescued by a smirch agent. He, you know... 
and also yeah i mean what's what's vesper's plan how has vesper done this whole thing where she has she has managed to persuade the shifa to kidnap her um but she's not she's working for smush i mean it's a very i don't understand what she's sort of trying to do there really she's trying to help the shifa get the money but why yes. doesn't make much sense i don't think Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, obviously, the, there have been screen interpretations of the saint and, you know, screen interpretations of, of Buchan's work, etc. I mean, can we envisage this one hitting the screen? I mean, if, if the Americans do it, they're sure to call him Jimmy Bond. Without a doubt. I, I, I feel this doesn't work as a movie because the main character, Mr. Bond, is an anti-hero. You think about when Vespa goes off uh, or is captured, shall we say, kidnapped, you know, Bond says the girl will just have to take it. The job was more important than her. How does that transfer to, to movie where you have the, the, the knight in shining armor? This is very different. I don't know. Yeah, if people take You're it. right. They'll never make a movie out of this. Now, I think it would be extremely difficult to film this because even yeah. though there is a hell of a lot going on in terms of 218 pages, quite a lot of it is internal stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, and if you actually look at the action, I mean, really, there's a, you know, a game, a, a game of cards. I mean, how would you film that and make it exciting? Um, and then a really gruesome torture scene, which I can't, I mean, you wouldn't get it past the censors. How can you possibly show that on film? You can't. Um, you can't possibly have the, you know, it's premarital sex. He's thinking of marrying her, um, but, you know, he's sleeping with her already. They've mm. just met. Um, then she, and then, you know, the ending. I mean, you can't have, have a, a film with, with, some, with the main character saying the bitch is dead. I mean, it's not, there's no, it's a non-starter. And it all takes place in one location. I mean, if I would have any suggestion for, for Mr. Fleming, I would say perhaps widen the scope a bit. You know, perhaps not one town. Perhaps have a bit of globe, you know, trotting. Uh, well, if he I does do a sequel, maybe that might happen. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it would be a good idea to. I, I mean, I I would like to see this, this Bond character, James Bond. I think his name is. I think it would yeah. be nice to see him in sort of different settings. But this yes. is this is glamorous, but it's still quite close. You know, there's yes. lots of places he could go. Yeah. Um, so I think that if Hollywood were to come calling, they might want a bit of a grander scale than a trade union, a, a French, you know, communist trade union brothel yeah. keeper. Uh, it's not huge stakes. Um, uh, even though the cards, you know, the game has got huge stakes of money, but the, the geopolitical stakes don't seem very, very large, I think. So they I probably think, want I something think... completely ridiculous, like a villain that cried blood or something like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah? You can imagine it. But uh, as you say, I think well, Mary yeah, Whitehouse quite, would have a thing or two. To, Mary Whitehouse would have a thing or two to say about mm -hmm. the about oh. the censorship of this, Jeremy. Yeah, you're right. I also well, think what Jeremy said earlier on. I didn't pick up on this when I was reading it, but you're absolutely right. What is the point of Vespa? You know, how is she helping him? So you can imagine that on the screen, you say, like, "Well, is she just oh. there as the pretty appendage?" I don't yeah. think it would work as well because you would ask that question: well, "What is she actually doing?" In the book, I didn't really think about you have it. To give her a job or something. Oh, Shane, I, I, Shane, I can see the point of Vespa altogether. I think she's <laughs> an essential part of the story. Yes. Yes, yeah. but her role, her role, her role in British intelligence. Yes, is, and also the chances that someone, you know, working and what does she do in in head of this? I mean, is she an agent or what? We don't really know what she does. But the, mm. the chances that that Smirsh has an operative working within the Soviet section who then gets assigned by head of S, uh, you know, against Smirsh, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it seems a bit odd. Um, however, he's killed her off. You know, she can't come back. Um, he's, you know, started with this sort of tragic tale. Um, and in a way, I think that is, we kind of go back to square one, the kind of cold character that we were introduced to, that Shane reacted to. I imagine in, in the next book, you know, he'll be even more hardened. I mean, by this experience would, would, you know, it's a nightmare. So, I mean, for anyone to have gone through this, it would be no yeah. surprise if he was cold and brutal and mechanical from now on, because someone who he thought he was going to marry has just betrayed him, killed herself. So he will be a very tough, a very, you know, what Fleming calls in his, in his uh, Sunday Times article, a toughie. You know, this, this is a toughie. It is a noir novel. Yeah, it is. It is, yeah. Right. Probably the, 
is it probably the first, although Ambler's, uh, some of Ambler's work, one could probably categorize as. I think it's an, it, the, the combination of having this kind of clubland, high life kind of stuff, yeah, fucking stuff, with this very, very tough, really, really gr grim you know, brutal thing. I think that is, that is a, a new development in, in, this, in this genre. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope the book sells well because I definitely want to read another one. Yes, well, if there's another one, we'll have to come back and do this all over again. Yeah, yeah we, we will. Do. I mean, do we, do, we have, do we know how long, has he, has he been writing it long? I mean, maybe it will be coming out, you know, quite soon. Yes, well, uh, where are we? Now? We're April now, so uh, he should be back from, if he's not back already, he should be back from Jamaica very soon, I would think. Maybe we can, uh, we can use some inside track at Cape to try and find out what's going on. Hmm. Or maybe even this chap that designed his last cover, maybe he'll know. Yeah. What was his name? It was uh, Kenneth Lewis, yes? Yeah. Designer at, um, at the paper, the newspaper. We'll have to put feelers out. I, have you seen I, many? I think there's going to be a new one. I'm sure of it. When you're mooching about London, David, do you see many people reading it? Uh, yes. And I see a lot of women reading it, actually, as well, which is interesting. Mm. Okay. But you said, how, how many copies did you say were, were printed? Well, in the first, my understanding is, is on the first print run, there were 4,728 copies. Mm. Uh, and they sold out. I mean, we were lucky because we got one of the first editions. Maybe one day that'll be worth a bother. Yeah, hold, hold on we to that. Ours. We got ours in April. Um, but uh, evidently, um, there, is going, there is going to be a second print run. And uh, pre-orders are very heavy for that. So uh, it sold well. It has but you sold need, very well. But your missus was telling me she's had enough of all your books, David. So you're going to have to hide these somewhere. I, I am. Probably friend. all I'll be left with at the end of the day is this. <laughs> well, a, post, a postcard. Yeah, yes. a postcard. Yeah, a, a postcard. postcard. Casino Royale. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's been great chatting about this. It's amazing. We're uh, almost hour and 10 minutes talking about a book of 218 pages. Um, it's, it's, it's been a lot great. about it. Yeah. It's been great. Don't Marvelous. Thank you Thanks all. Thanks very, Thanks much, very much, Shane. It's been super. Thank you, Jeremy. Cheers.